State of our Black Youth Report that was released earlier this week. We will discuss the data, we'll talk about what it means for our community, and then we will talk about follow-up with next steps. Right now, I have Tuesday Tate, Dr. Virginia Kane, and Sandy Runkle with us in the studio. How are you ladies? Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Fine, thanks. Good morning, and if, and if we can just start out by first, I would like to talk and turn my attention to Ms. Tate, and if you can just explain to our listener, listeners, can you tell us a little bit about the State of Our Black Youth Report? Great, great. The State of Our Black Youth Report uh, presents, a state, presents statewide data on the health and well-being of our Indiana black youth. Uh, it also looks at local data. It also looks at local data for the following 16 communities, Anderson, East Chicago, Elkhart, Evansville, Fort Wayne, Gary, Hammond, Indianapolis, of course, Jeffersonville, Kokomo, Lafayette, Marion, uh, Michigan City, Muncie, South Bend, and Terre Haute. Uh, our 2012 uh, State of Our Black Youth Report, also known as SOBI, is uh, the third in uh, our series of doing these reports. And um, Tuesday, with respect to some of the topics in the report, I know that we have child abuse and neglect as one of the topics, health, a real big issue for us, particularly in the African American community, mm -hmm. education, um, families, and um, a lot of different things that um, are identified in the report. And I'd like to talk to Dr. Virginia Kane real quick with the Marion County Health Department. Hi, Dr. Kane. Hey, how are you? Good. The, you know, one of the questions, according to the report, black infant deaths in Indiana have increased 12% from 2004 to 2009 and are 32.5% higher than the United States. What do you think is attributing to that increase? Well, one of the things we know is, is that if a mother does not receive prenatal care. Her baby is five times more likely to have higher death rates than a mother who's received prenatal care. And we know sometime during this period between 2004 and 2009, in the state of Indiana, we lost what's called presumptive eligibility. What do I mean by presumptive eligibility? Well, if I was a mom and I didn't have a health care provider, I could find a new health care provider, and that health care provider could go back and get Medicaid reimbursement for that mom three months back. So if I'm just seeing, I'm a new physician, I'm seeing this mom, but she hasn't signed up for insurance, I've got three months for her to sign up and I can get reimbursed mm -hmm. for seeing her that visit. But unfortunately, we lost this legislation that does presumptive eligibility for a number of years. And so doctors were saying, I can't afford to take care of these moms free of charge. Mm -hmm. So moms didn't have free access to going to doctors for prenatal care then. And so you had a lot of moms just waiting till they got real sick or going to the emergency room. And we know you have to have at least six prenatal visits in order to have a healthy baby. But they have to start in the first trimester. And you say to yourself, well, you know, I've had a baby before. I can take care of myself. I don't have to go to a doctor. I know how to take care of myself. Number one thing that causes what we call low birth weight babies is if you're anemic or not. And iron deficiency anemia is one of the number one criteria that causes a low birth weight baby. And low birth weight babies, they get sick real early. A lot of times they'll be in the intensive care unit for a long period of time. They don't have that immunity from their mom, the normal immune system, <coughs> helping to fight off infections. Mm -hmm. You need to know sometimes pregnant mothers have urinary tract infections. You got to know that and treat that. Uh, and there's some other bacterial infections that can cause problems with the newborn baby while you need to be in the prenatal care. So if you're not starting those prenatal vitamins early at the start, prevent anemia, mm -hmm. you have all kind of problems. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to segue and um, ask Ms. Runkle a question. Um, you know, maltreatment includes neglect, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. And maltreatment of black youth increased from 16.5% from 2006 to 2010, and is 45.2% higher than the U.S. rate. And that's what the report revealed in 2010. Do you know what is attributing to this increase and what can be done to address it? 
You know, it, it's a surprise to no one that child maltreatment is such a complicated issue, and it almost goes back to the old adage, you know, the, what came first, the, the chicken or the egg, because with child maltreatment, uh, especially, um, and we certainly don't want to put a, a degree on any of the forms, which also we would argue would include emotional maltreatment, um, physical abuse and sexual abuse unfortunately can have such uh, long-term effects on children and then as they grow. So if, for instance, you have a child who is maltreated, then they may have issues of learning in school. Right. Then that may uh, parlay into issues of getting a job mm -hmm. or crime. Right. Uh, for instance, with sexual abuse, a, a lot of people are very surprised to know that 60% of all teen first pregnancies are preceded by an event wow. of sexual e abuse. Mm -hmm. So here you have some of these increases, and then if you look at some of the other statistics, uh, some of the maltreatment may have contributed then to some of the other things that, that we're seeing because, you know, for us, and I don't want to use the term if, but when we prevent child maltreatment, you know, we really strongly feel that we're going to be able to prevent a lot of the other issues that, that we may be seeing. But, you know, in, in response to the causation, it could be a number of things. It could be what I've just said, you know, if there's a history of maltreatment, um, a lack of, of parenting knowledge, um, the economy has really taken a hit. And, and while you're on that topic, sure. because what was very shocking in this report um, to me was that um, it revealed that 41% of our youth, black youth in the state of Indiana, live in poverty. And um, it also revealed that the median household income for a black family is $16,000 less than that for the total population in Indiana. And I heard you previously say that the economics is a factor. How much do you think, with looking at Indiana data, um, particularly that we're doing worse economically um, than across the United States in the state of Indiana, how much do you think that that factor is playing with all of these factors that we talked about today um, and that we will talk about today with the maltreatment being one of them? You know, we try to look at more long-term trends with that because we also want to be real careful in stating that just because someone lives in poverty doesn't mean that they are in any way not meeting their, their children's needs because perhaps they're more able to, to find resources or they have support systems. So really, we would more like to say that if it's insufficient income, it's also insufficient income without support systems, mm -hmm. without being able to access resources. Uh, maybe there is domestic violence or substance abuse or mental health, an unresolved mental health issue. So, you know, there may be other factors that play a part. Now, can insufficient income be a risk factor? Yes, because of the added stress, and so then a parent might you know, become angry, uh, more frustrated at, you know, their mm -hmm. crying child. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it could be almost that, that proverbial straw, you know, that, that finally pushes someone because they're so under stress because of the economics. But, a, again, we want to be really careful that that alone right. is not always, you know, the the piece that's, that's missing. It's usually, again, more inclusive of other pieces like lack of resources. Dr. Kane, I'm, I'm going to um, come back and ask you a question regarding HIV AIDS. Um, one of the things that the report revealed that it that in 2010, the rate of new diagnosis of HIV AIDS was 10 times greater than the rate for the white population when we talk about the black community. One thing that jumped out to me, and I'm going to quote specifically what the report stated, it said, while the highest rates of new diagnosis in Indiana in both 2009 and 2010 were among young adults in their 20s, a notable jump in the diagnosis rate was seen between the 10 to 14 age group and the 15 to 19 age group. What are your thoughts? Well, one, um, uh, it, Indiana, in the state of Indiana, 
uh, has state legislation that requires every student um, in high schools to receive HIV education. Okay. So we, we realize that they're receiving the HIV education. I think sometimes there's a false myth out there by them that because now that we have this whole army of HIV medications, mm -hmm. that one, if I do get infected, mm -hmm. it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But secondly, we still run into young teenagers who think they're invincible, that everybody else is going to get infected, but I'm not going to get infected. And so we really have to strongly encourage using protective measures like condoms if they are going to be sexually active. And I think they have to be a little bit more selective in who they're having uh, uh, sex with. And we really have to really emphasize stronger education um, for our young adults um, about how vulnerable they can be for not only HIV, but other sexually transmitted diseases, the human papillomavirus, which we now equate with cervical cancer in young women, um, anal uh, rectal carcinoma or rectal cancer in young men, and it's happening now. And so we really have to continue to do more education. But parents, you got to talk to your kids. You know, it, it's not enough that uh, people from the outside is responsible for educating your children. You have to educate your children. Exactly. And uh, we have to re continue to re-emphasize that or some adult person in the family has got to re-emphasize this for your children. And then whether we like it or not, children emulate their adults. Mm. So you, you can't be telling them one thing and you act another. Right. Mm. Right. You can't be telling them th one thing and they see you act another way. Right, that's right. You know, when I read the report, um, one of the things that it indicated with respect to the new diagnosis of HIV-AIDS, um, it indicated that men were impacted more heavily than women in Indiana and the United States, but it, it didn't speak to um, the race breakdown. And I know that I always thought that African-American women um, were impacted more than African American men. Is that still the case? Because I didn't, I couldn't glean that from the data in the report, specifically as it's, it related to the race. It's actually changed. Gender. Okay, so it's actually changed. We're seeing more African American men being impacted than women. Wow. And so, uh, uh, one of those reasons I think is, is that like we're catching a lot of women early uh, in their pregnancies where. It's routine now. You, you're testing every woman who comes in with a pregnancy for mm. HIV. So they get that additional education okay. when it happens and, and also try to prevent them from spreading infection to the, to the other males. Mm. Uh, but you should know from an anatomy standpoint, a male is more effective in passing the infection to a young woman because she has this wound and she's able to keep all those fluids inside that womb for a longer period of time and more absorption for that HIV virus to get into a, a wound. So if a, if, HIV, if a woman was HIV infected, um, she can't transmit as effectively to the male as she does, as the male does to the female. Okay. Now, unfor for, but unfortunately, um, uh, we, we, um, we have other males that may be more vulnerable uh, to getting infections when you're having a male having sex with another male so that they are also at a higher risk for acquiring the HIV infection. And when we're seeing this epidemic take place now, uh, there's a high percentage of males who have sex with other males who are at risk for HIV, and they're at risk for syphilis. We're seeing syphilis come back wow. now. Wow. And because syphilis can have a break in the skin, it's easier to transmit the HIV infection. And I have to tell you, we have a significant number of bisexual men, men who are comfortable and love having sex with females as well as having sex with males. Mm. Wow. Um, Sandy, and this is really related to the maltreatment question earlier. One of the data also revealed that in 2010, the reported rate of um, 
um, when we we talk about the um, we talked about maltreatment and then the reported rate of juvenile case violence for children in need of services, which is CHINS, that's what we know as CHINS, um, due to abuse, neglect, or endangerment, according to the report, was two and a half times higher for black children. Are those the same factors that we're t that you talked about earlier when we talk about maltreatment? Are we dealing with the same um, factors that would take place um, that you talked about earlier with maltreatment? And I'm curious as to what is being done um, to address this increase in rate? It, it could be, and you know, like anything else, it's it's hard to put. Uh, a definitive finger on on causation. Um, there's a lot of education that is taking place. Uh, of course, we like to think across the board with everyone, which is what primary prevention is. And I know that there has been a great deal more. In, you know, I've noticed this in the last several years of of cooperation among agencies to try to get the word out. And even agencies that, you know, we may have typically thought of as what we would call tertiary prevention, meaning they don't respond until after something has happened. Uh, for, the, for instance, the Department of Child Services, even they have really stepped up eff efforts to work toward the more primary and secondary prevention efforts and have, you know, partnered with a lot of agencies and organizations because, you know, you really have to have buy-in from everyone, the entire community, and I've also stressed the faith community in this. Mm -hmm. it, it cannot just be agencies. In fact, it, it will not succeed if you're just trying to talk about agencies trying to you know, solve this issue. Right. You have to have the faith community. You have to have, as Dr. Kane said, you have to have parents. You have to have everyone involved understanding that this is everyone's problem. Mm -hmm. And so it's much more uh, a, a collaborative effort across the board. And, you know, we don't feel it's too little too late uh, by any means. Um, but I would say it's, it's probably stepped up in the last two or three years where agencies and, and the faith community have really tried to draw together to get education, awareness, and again, starting very early. Dr. Kane's absolutely right. You have to start really early when you're educating children about health issues, body issues. You have to work with parents uh, or parents to be. I'm going to talk mm -hmm. about primary prevention. Parents to be uh, about um, resources, about child development. We have to encourage our schools to uh, be able to have <coughs> classes like they used to that would address child development and what to expect from you know young children. <coughs> so it really has a lot to do with education, education. and support right. for all. But it takes everybody. Mm -hmm. yes. Definitely, definitely. Um, Dr. Kane, one of the, um, I know that the report probably wasn't shocking in this area, but one of the things that the report revealed um, was that 16.6% of black high school students are obese. And this rate is 46%. That's almost 50% higher than that of white students. Mm -hmm. I, I also want to get your thoughts because we know from obesity, obesity that stems all sorts of other health issues. And just want to kind of get your thoughts on that data and um, what can be done to address that issue. Well, I, I think one has a lot has to do with the uh, nutrition and diet. I also think that uh, what's impacted a lot is geographically where you live. Hmm. So um, we know that we call something called food deserts. So what's my likelihood to get healthy foods if there's no major grocery store nearby me? Mm -hmm. The only place I have access to get my food is either fast food restaurants or I go to a gas station that may sell some food products, but a lot of times I can't get the fruits and the vegetables that I want. And if I really want to get those um, healthy products, I've got to get on a bus. I may have young children. It's winter. It's snowing or it's raining. Wow. And what's the what's the likelihood I can carry a large bag of groceries? You know, I, I have to do it. In, in, and unfortunately, we our transition system here is if I'm on the bus, 
I may have to go all the way downtown to get close to where I got to go to get to a grocery store. Wow. So we have so many tremendous barriers, I think, that's from a nutrition standpoint. Now let's talk about physical activity. Depending on where you live and the safety profile, do you have sidewalks in front of where you live? Can, is there a place where you can um, exercise? So people may be vulnerable in, in that area where they can't really do the exercise. Our school systems don't require every grade to do physical activity in the state of Indiana. It's not required. In Illinois it is, mm -hmm. but not in the state of Indiana. It doesn't uh, happen. Now, can I talk about black women? Sure. Okay, sorry, since I am African American, mm -hmm. so I'm black. You know, some of us, when we exercise, we don't like to get our, our hair. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So you, right. you know what I'm talking okay. about, ladies out there. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. I love to go swim, but I can't afford to get my hair wet. Yeah. You know, I'm afraid my hair might be messing up if I'm, I'm exercising. So this is a cultural thing. Yes. We need to have families exercise together. You know, walk or uh, ride a bicycle. And you can even learn to do exercises sitting down in a chair, those resistance band exercises. So we're getting there. We're definitely making progress, but we have a lot of work. And then you won't believe this. It's the perception of whether you're overweight or not. Right. A lot of women who are men who we know are overweight may not see themselves as being overweight and think we're at the natural weight when in reality we are overweight based on the frame of our body. Mm -hmm. So we do need some education from our providers in mm -hmm. talking about this concept. What about those who don't go to the doctor? Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. from an education standpoint, because we know that is an issue, particularly in our community. Um, we, we're going to have to do a better job of outreach to those individuals. We mm -hmm. have to figure out those venues or places where they're more likely to, to hear about this. You know, they need to learn how to read menus. I, I can't even tell you about this. I went to, a, I got some soul food yesterday, and uh, uh, the amount of food I got mm -hmm. uh, for the what I paid for, I told them, you, you're losing money in this business because you're giving me so much food. And if we can hold that thought, I've been told by my producer that it's time to take a break. And when we come back, we will talk about youth justice, children and families, and my special topic on education. Um, and so, ladies, thank you so much for joining me you're today. Um, Indiana Black Expo looks forward to partnering with all of you to address the issues that have been identified in the report. Welcome back. You are listening to Unity and Community, and I am today's guest host, Tanya Bell, President and CEO with Indiana Black Expo. And I want to uh, go back real quick, Dr. Kane, um, to allow you to finish up on the conversation of obesity. We were just in the studio having a really interesting conversation about black women and their hair were working out. But I do want you, because it's a very important topic, to finish finish up that topic. Well, we know that uh, the number of schools that have gotten excellent initiatives out there really gun ho about addressing obesity uh, uh, in their programs. Pike uh, Township has a fantastic program and I was just part of a press conference with uh, Arlington Woods Elementary School, uh, an IPS school with a major fruit vendor where they um, got uh, well-known recognized people t talking about what their favorite fruits were uh, like Tamika Ketching and uh, one of our leading uh, Indy uh, car drivers who lives here in uh, Carmel and uh, in, in Indianapolis Symphony, um, female violinist. And they, they talked about their f special favorite vegetables, and um, they're providing all these free fruits and vegetables for their children. So some incredible programs that are going out. But we got to know... We've got to increase more water consumption. We've got to stop our children from drinking all this soda, beverages that's got a lot of sugar. And we've got to increase the exercise times uh, of these children. We've got some wonderful experts in the community. I know uh, Dr. Deborah Carter Miller, mm -hmm. uh, a local physician, does a lot of childhood obesity. Dr. Mercy Obami mm -hmm. uh, from St. Francis does a lot of... Um, um, obesity work. So we've got so many experts here 
and programs. Uh, but we also, I want folks, we got to support um, the right kind of transportation systems and how we build roads and design communities so that we have those sidewalks and those new developments. Mm -hmm. And it's built more for the pedestrian and not for the um, right. building it for cars. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to forget one important factor, and that is if you're seeing a lot of children, adults with obesity, you're seeing a lot of diabetes now. Mm -hmm. So one out of every third child is mm -hmm. obese wow. is going to mm -hmm. develop diabetes, and that's associated with can be associated with uh, kidney failure, amputations, and so um, uh, families. You got to eat right, but you got to exercise as well. Spend less time watching TV and get outdoors. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kane, for your expertise on this subject. Um, as I indicated before, we really look forward to working with you and counting on you for your expertise and your guidance with respect to the implementation phase of the State of Our Black Youth Report. So thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Wait, I just want to compliment Black Expo for getting this very important message out there. And it's a great report that doesn't only just talk about uh, what's, what's actually happening here, but it actually gives some wonderful information about what you can do to address mm -hmm. these issues. Mm -hmm. So, great. And before you leave, I'm going to go ahead and take um, Brenda is on the line um, because Brenda may have an issue as it relates to the health component of the State of Our Black Youth Report. Brenda? Good. How are you? Hey, how are you? She did. She did. Brenda, that is an excellent uh, question, and one of the things that we will do, because it's not over after today, and we will still partner um, with Sandy and that agency, and we will get this question to her. And so you know the number at Indiana Black Expo, 925-2702. Um, we'll take your information down, if the producer can take your information down, and we'll get back with you with a response to that question. And that that is a good question because we, you know, what we're doing today is we're just releasing data, what the data shows. We have not talked about next steps, and that is moving forward with engaging a consultant to come in and put on a strategic plan to address the issues identified in the report. And so those are the type of questions that we need. So when we are focused on phase two, we have all the data needed in order to develop a statewide plan to address these issues that are impacting our community. So thank you very much for your call. We appreciate it. Brenda, can I just say something? I'm Dr. Kane, and I know Superintendent Jones of Pike Township, and he's a man of, uh, of integrity and respect, and he's, he's very caring for these children. Uh, if this indeed did happen, it's unfortunate uh, that it, it, it implies that teachers may need more training and definitely education. But I, without a doubt, I know if those kind of things are happening, this is the kind of thing that I know he would address very quickly and try to make sure that it never happened again. Because they've got some excellent teachers out in Pike 
And I would not want it to be perceived that one wrong thing is representative of that entire teaching body because they're doing some incredible things out there. Good point, Dr. King. If we could go ahead and get um, Bill Glick on the phone. Bill Glick is the executive director with the Indiana Juvenile Justice Task Force and has been very instrumental. So right now, I've just been told by my producer that we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will have Bill Glick with the Indiana Juvenile Justice Task Force on the phone, as well as some other experts that we will talk to in the areas of education and with dealing with our family structure. Welcome back. You are listening to Unity in the Community, and I am today's guest host, Tanya Bell, President and CEO with Indiana Black Expo. At this time, I want to go ahead and segue into the youth justice component of the State of Our Black Youth Report. And right now, we should, we should have Bill Glick, the Executive Director of the Indiana Juvenile Justice Task Force, Inc., on the phone with us. Bill, are you on the phone? Uh, yes, Tanya. I've been patiently waiting. The discussion <laughs> has been just fascinating, and I appreciate the privilege to participate in the show today. Thank you so much, and I was going to say thank you so much for patiently waiting because I've looked at the screen and I've seen you up here for the last 30 minutes. And, you know, I just wanted to really talk about um, some of the things identified in the report. It appears from the report that we have made some strides in youth justice. There has been a decrease in juvenile delinquency, case filings, and commitments to the Indiana Department of Correction. At our press conference, um, I know that you spoke to the media and you indicated that even with the decrease, black children are still two times more likely to wind up in the system than children of, children of other races charged with the same offense. And one of the things, Bill, that you talked about with respect to one of the problems, one of the problems being poor legal counsel. For our listeners, can you expound on that just some? Yes, and I actually would say, Tanya, that the figure is more like three to one. Uh, three to one. The um, commitment to the Department of Corrections, for example, for black youth, has been something in the order of four commitments to the children in the general population. And for all other races, it's just 1.3. Mm -hmm. That ratio is actually still maintained at about a three to one um, margin. One of the things that we um, at the task force and with other agencies has looked at over the course of a number of years has been what happens on the ground. The report does a wonderful job of giving us what we might call the mile high perspective, and that is the statistics tell us the uh, number of youth who've been filed per thousand. But what they don't tell us is what happens when we get the community level. Mm -hmm. At the community level, we're still finding, for example, that if I have a uh, minority youth, a black youth, and a non-minority youth who commit the same crime delinquent infraction, for some reason, the black youth is about three times more likely to be processed into deeper levels of our juvenile justice system than the Caucasian youth might be. When we look at why that could be, one of the reasons is, that, excuse me, the difference in the raw number of Caucasian youth who are able to afford a private defense counsel. Now, I really want to be careful here, not to take away anything from our, our public defender system, because uh, I have many, many close friends in the public defender system. But <coughs> across the, uh, the juvenile justice system, we do find that it's much less likely for a youth who's been uh, defended by a uh, private attorney, much less likely for that young person to uh, process the system by the person. I mean, much more likely that that white youth, uh, who would be typically more likely to have a, a private defense counsel, much more likely for that youth to be remanded to his or her own uh, parents. I think there's still a societal bias about sending black kids home after they've been arrested or after they've been processed to court. Now, it's interesting that across the state, we do have a movement called the Juvenile Detention Alternative, which is JDAI, 
AI. Any AI has been effective in reducing the number of youth who are to our detention centers. In fact, Marion County in the Dallas Detention Center has one half to one third of the youth that it, that it has uh, on a daily basis 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. However, when we look at the proportion of black youth who are processed into detention, we still see that same very high distance. Well, Bill, can I can I ask you this? Has there ever been a study done within the pool of black youth on um, when you're dealing with the same crime that's looked at um, the difference with respect to a private counsel versus a public defender to kind of see how that breaks down and if that is really the factor that is playing the part in that? Not that I know of, Tanya, but I think it's definitely a, an excellent idea in addition to your strategic planning process when you do move from the overall um, support to actually getting the strategic planning um, and operational um, ideas impacted on the ground. Because the, re the reason why I asked that, Bill, is wouldn't that tell us whether or not this private defense counsel is really the issue that's playing a role versus the societal bias if we've done it within our own pool of black youth to see if that is really the case? And that's one of the things I'm looking at. That would be, uh, that would be an excellent addition to the information that's already in the report. Uh, so, yes, I would totally endorse that. Look at um, what happens within the courtrooms across the um, the third, at least across the thirteen communities that are, are pinpointed in the um, in the report. And we also need to look at what happens um, internally versus externally. We're talking about impact um, on our youth in the juvenile justice. By, by the internal factors, I mean uh, what's the impact of the level of education that this student has achieved. The student who's moving into the juvenile justice system, um, uh, a victim of a larger achievement gap. Uh, where is this youth, if we can assess where this youth is, in terms of his or her adolescent brain development? We know, of course, now that um, that there's actual physical evidence about lack of maturity uh, in adolescence. You need to know, well, has this child been a victim of trauma? Has this child been a victim of malnutrition? Has there been other things that impede that uh, brain development even uh, to a greater extent than it would be if um, the child had developed normally? Um, what has been the impact of poverty on right. this young person? Right. Is there a family history of addiction? Is there a family history of other um, uh, antisocial behavior? Right. Are there other um, folks in the, in the family system, the family constellation, who are not? And Bill, that you've raised an interesting point because even as I lis listen to all of the experts at the table and we talk about maltreatment, we talk about health, we talk about youth justice, um, in a minute we're going to um, talk to Dr. Ruth Lambert with respect to our families. Um, you know, it seems like they're all related and correlated. And, you know, one of the things that I keep going back to is the economics, and I keep going back to the correlation. And I know that other factors are present, but when you look at the fact that 41% of our youth, black youth in Indiana is in poverty, and I keep going back to that, and the fact that our median household income is $16,000 less than the household income for the total population. To me, it seems like that is a substantial factor that plays into everything that we're talking about here today. And at this point, I do want to go ahead because I know we're running out of time with 15 minutes left and we still need to talk about children and families. And we definitely need to hit on education, which is key um, here today. And so I do want to segue and, and thank you, Bill, for joining us today. I really appreciate um, your contributions to our State of Our Black Youth Report. And we do look forward to partnering with you and working with you with respect to the implementation phase of SOBI. Thank you, Tanya. I appreciate it. It's been a privilege to work with you.
Thank you so much. And right now, I do want to introduce two more of our guests that are in the studio with me today. I do have Dr. Ruth Lambert, who is the Executive Director of Indiana Healthy Marriage and Families Coalition, as well as Dantanya Slack, who is a family advocate focused on family and education and also the Vice President of the Indianapolis Chapter of Indiana Black Expo. Hello, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And so... I want to turn our t attention today. It's, it's interesting, and Dr. Um, Lambert, I do want to start with you. Um, you know, Erica Smith, and I'm pretty <coughs> sure you read the article in the Star following our press conference where she indicated that leaders in our black community have been focused on the same strategy as it related to the promotion of marriage. Um, when we look at the statistical information, particularly the report revealing that 57.7% of our black families are headed by single mothers. She indicated that we should look at this more as the reality and less as the problem. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, is this more about poverty and less about family structure? What are your thoughts in this area? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I do have sinus drainage this morning, so just bear with me. Okay. Um, I, I take issue with that in that Sure, it's something that right now is a reality, but it does not have to remain that way. Uh, we have to look at what has caused this to be uh, most of our families, African-American families, because I am African-American, proud to be. It's headed by African-American women. Mm -hmm. Part of that has been because of the high number of, of, of males, black males particularly, that are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're incarcerated, how can they be in the community uh, developing healthy relationships, be in the homes, be there to affected parent their children? Also, one of the other issues is that black men do have pride. They feel good about themselves, want to continue to feel good about themselves. When they're not able to get jobs and, and they do understand what their role is as a father, as a husband, not able to get jobs that will help take care of their families, economic growth and development and well-being, they feel less than whole, so they tend to uh, try to find ways to uh, feel better about themselves, which often doesn't work because they're not that active involved with, the, with their family. And it's not by choice. I think the system needs to look at how we um, support families, particularly those who are uh, poverty or near poverty, because of the disincentives. Nobody talks about that, you know, in terms of insurance. Uh, because, because when uh, young men and young women are together sometimes uh, because of the system. I know I worked for the child welfare system for 20 years, and I know sometimes it's not always fair uh, to families. So we need to look at laws and regulations that uh, help families stay together and help uh, both parents being involved in the household. We look at our welfare system. It's getting better, but it doesn't encourage the father to be involved, particularly if, if they're not married. If they're married, what they do? They cut off services before they can become financially stable. Mm. So I don't particularly agree that it has to be a reality because I think that we can put programs and services in place that will help, about, help our families balance out. One other thing that, I miss, uh, that they don't talk about is that we don't have laws govern, governing families. You know, I said, well, government shouldn't be involved in families, you know, and, but they, we're involved in, every, involved in everything else, so why not have some family laws governing that? Just like with Indiana Minority Health Coalition. They have funds that deal with minority health. They have allocations. Why can't we have funds and have uh, regulations and uh, uh, laws that deal with that. And I challenge that we, Black Expo and other agencies that are concerned about the welfare of African American families, that we look at talking to our legislators and our elected officials about positive laws governing families. That's a good, good point. Mm -hmm. I do want to um, segue into education um, real quick. And 
um, Dantonia, um, one of the things that I'd like to talk about, and I don't want to get into waivers today just because I see that we only have a few minutes left, okay. and I know that we can talk about that for an hour. Mm -hmm. But I do want to talk about Core 40 and Core 40 with honors diplomas. I, I, I know the report indicated that there was an increase, 18.1% to be exact, in the number of black graduates receiving this type of diploma. Um, there's been a lot of conversations around waivers, but I'm curious as to um, the number, there's still a disparity there with respect to the core 40 and the core 40 with honors and you have the general diploma and we know that in order for you to be academically prepared for college, the core 40 with honors, I would say, is really what we should be striving our kids, if it's appropriate, to actually master. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on whether or not you think our community is educated even on the distinction or the difference between the Core 40 diploma and the Core 40 with Honors diploma? I would have to say <clears throat> that our community is not well adversed or well educated on the fact that there is a distinction and they have very um, profound impact on whether or not they go on to do post-secondary educational opportunities, seek those. Um, the Core 40 and the Core 40 with Honors, obviously, um, it's more it's based upon how many honor classes one takes. Mm -hmm. In the Core 40 with honors, having more of a rigorous educational background while you're applying to college um, looks more, um, is viewed much more favorably to college admissions counselors. Now, one of the other things that the report sure reveals is, is that 31% um, of all students, all students um, require remediation as it relates to college but 55% of black students requires remediation. And I know there is that direct correlation, once again, between the core 40 or core 40 with honors. And arguably, there'd be some folks out there that says that system is not even enough for our kids to be academically prepared when you really look at um, how we're faring. But what are your thoughts with respect to the need for remediation? I, I know this gets into the whole K through 12 system and and, and can we just address parents and kind of talk to parents with respect to um, what they can be doing to make, an, to make sure that their kids are on the right path, whether or not it's a, core, it's a Core 40 diploma or Core 40 with honors, but some of the things that they should be doing to make, to make sure that their kids are on the right track? Well, a lot of times we um, like to sit back and wait for people to give us information. We can be more proactive by going to the Department of Education website to find out what those requirements are and the distinctions between each of those diplomas are. And what your child, and compare what your child is expected to have for each level of diploma and um, what they're actually taking, what their counselor is offering them to take. And then calling the school. A lot of times, I'm a single mom myself with four boys and a lot of times I can't get to the school but through email and um, phone calls we can talk to our um, counselors and, and, and make sure that what's going on is um, it is in pace with where my, our child needs to be. Right. Also um, what one can do is um, self-education um, communicate with this child we don't take time out to find out what's really going on with our children mm -hmm. um, if they are struggling, finding those resources that are there. A lot of the resources are free. Um, the schools are offering much more um, supports that are free for the student and ensuring that they get into those supports. After school tutoring, um, summer school is important. A lot of people say our summers are short, especially in some districts. But the bottom line is these are where they're getting those resources right. in, in order to stay on pace mm -hmm. and on core with what they need in order to graduate on time and with the proper um, credits mm -hmm. and things of that nature in order to proceed to whatever next step there is. And you must understand that not every child is going to go to college. Mm -hmm. There are excellent vocational programs out there that will help prepare students before even they get to, um, before they graduate. They mm -hmm. can leave high school with a plumbing certification, et cetera, yes. all kinds of um, opportunities out there. But being honest with yourself, being proactive about getting the information, not waiting for the counselor or anyone else to come and give you that information, but getting out there and make sure you stay ahead of things, just like we do with most things mm -hmm. in our in our community. That's a good thought. Um, Tuesday, did you have anything to add to that? Um, you know, education and family are my passions, and um, I think certainly what we continue to hear today is parent involvement. Mm -hmm. Parents have to get involved with every aspect of what's in this report, what's been reported, what is yet to be reported, mm -hmm. and we want your um, your input, 
Uh, whatever um, concerns you have, go onto our website, www.indianablackexpo.com. Pull the report down, read over it, familiarize yourself, and become engaged in your children's lives. So many of you are already doing that. Pull your girlfriends in, pull your brother friends in, and ask right. them to now mm -hmm. get involved in what we are doing to turn mm -hmm. our community around. We know you love your children, we love mm -hmm. your children, and we want to see our community go to a better level. Final thoughts real yeah. quick, Dr. Well, Amber. you know, there's two parts of the education. That's the academic and the family. And there are family education programs, healthy relationship, healthy marriage, marriages and healthy uh, race relationship for children, safe dates that we can call Black Expo or our office. We have free classes, educational classes that help improve that relationship so you can have a healthy family that's in the best interest of the children. Thank you Excellent. so much for joining us today and I want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in to Unity in the Community. Again, for that report, please download it from the Indiana Black Expo website at www.indianablackexpo.com. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Thanks for bringing us on.